The Cincinnati Zoo's been here a long time, and we're now famous as the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. That long tradition, particularly in Cincinnati, where everybody values their, the history, uh, is very important. Um, as I say, Cincinnati's a zoo town. People love this zoo. This town stuck with us. People were still joining the zoo with notes, hey, you're not open yet, but we know you're gonna be open, we want you to make it. Uh, yeah, we're a very supportive town. From WLWT, this is Let's Talk Cincy, presented by Western and Southern Financial Group. Put our financial strength behind you. Anytime something is considered the best, is worth talking about. Hello everyone, I'm Curtis Fuller and welcome to Let's Talk Cincy. The Cincinnati Zoo is known all around the world and it is now ranked the best zoo in America in 2021, according to a poll conducted by USA Today's 10 Best. A panel of travel experts picked the initial nominees, then readers selected the top 10 winners by popular vote. The zoo's rich history began nearly 150 years ago in 1873. One person who knows the history as well as anyone is zoo director Thane Maynard. The zoo has been a big part of his life for nearly a half century. I mean, this is an amazing place. Second oldest zoo in the country. Talk about the history of the zoo. Well, you know, the Cincinnati Zoo's been here a long time and we're now famous as the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden, but that's been the case all along. When Andrew Erkenbrecher and those German immigrants started this zoo, they wanted to bring what they had had in Frankfurt and Stuttgart to Cincinnati, which was an urban park uh, with beautiful plantings, exotic animals, and cultural events. And our original title was the Cincinnati Zoological Garden. It's been a garden all along, but it's a garden on steroids now because we, we really get after it, that's for sure. But, you know, that tradition, back then, you can imagine how important that was. I mean, there wasn't a lot shaken in the 1870s, and so having a place like that where you could get out of over the Rhine or, or downtown where there were really no plants and come up to a beautiful garden was really significant. Um, and we still play that role today of respite from the city, a place that's shady and soft, and lots and lots of cultural events. So, uh, you know, we're living that same mission, but that long tradition particularly in Cincinnati where everybody values their, the history, uh, is very important. Um, as I say, Cincinnati is a zoo town. People love this zoo. I mean, I go, whether I'm in Cleves, or I'm all the way out in Terrace Park, or I'm in Northern Kentucky, everybody I meet has a story about their kids went to zoo camp and grew up to be veterinarians, or they used to belong to the zoo for 50 years. And it's fun, the role that the zoo plays in families' lives here. That's why we're here. And it's good to see so many families back out, especially after the year we've, we've had. Uh, it's a reminder of how important the zoo is to Greater Cincinnati. It is true, you know, last year when the pandemic first hit and the governor closed the zoo, it ended up being three months, but we had no idea. You know, some of the zoos in California were closed for over a year. The National Zoo in DC was closed for over a year. And man, we'd be completely broke that have been the case because the zoo's expensive even when you're not open. You have the veterinarians, the keepers, we have to feed all the animals. But we made it through better than anybody would have thought. So that's that this town stuck with us. People were still joining the zoo with notes, hey, you're not open yet, but we know you're going to be open. We want you to make it. Uh, yeah, we're a very supportive town. 44 years for you? Ha! I know. <laughs> I got old quick, Curtis, I'm telling you. Don't we all? Yeah, I'm telling you. But talking to the zoo journey, business. How did you start here at the zoo and and obviously 44 years later well 44 years ago uh, there wasn't as great an interest in working in the zoo field as there is today i mean today if a job came open whether it's a zookeeper or a zoo educator which is how i started there'd be a hundred qualified kids applying for that job but that's after a couple generations of zoo camps and things where people really really got into this field back then for me it was just right place at the right time proctor had funded the world's first zoo education center, which is the wooden building we now call treetops, and we use it for a wide variety of purposes. But it had five classrooms, there had never been anything like it, and they needed some people to help lead programs. So I was fortunate, I'd uh, gotten out of grad school, and my wife's from Cincinnati, and she had a job writing at Cincinnati Magazine. And like a lot of young guys coming up, I'd never really been very thoughtful about my career. I thought I'd go to Africa or something and bang around for a few years. But suddenly I found myself married and I'm like, I should probably get a job. And so it was uh, fortunate, just right place at the right time. So 
I spent uh, 25 years yeah, working in the zoo's education department and, you know, helping that phenomenon grow, not just here but at other institutions where so many families today I mean, our zoo camps and zoo troop and all those participatory programs, volunteer programs like Zoo Team, they just fill up instantly because families really want their kids involved. You are a Cincinnati celebrity, a Cincinnati legend, and I, and I say that with all sincerity. Well, some of that's a tribute to we're a non-tourist town that doesn't take much to be a celebrity here if the zookeeper <laughs> can be, but don't forget my friend Jack Hanna because he put Columbus well, on course, the map yeah. and he's a household name and a darn good guy. But that is a reflection of a zoo like ours that has tremendous support in the community, including annual philanthropy and sponsorships for operations, and all of our capital is privately raised. This zoo is very plugged into the community. So we're out there, we're pitching the zoo every day, you know, whether it's encouraging people to get out here for events like, you know, the PNC Festival of Lights or our zoo babies, or it's to get sponsors to want to be directly involved with the zoo. Um, and as a result, I and others who represent the zoo are out there uh, working it pretty good. You know, there are some towns where the funding's different and the zoo's not as engaged in the community. Um, National Zoo in Washington's part of the Smithsonian, they don't need to hustle. And of course, the San Diego Zoo, if you have a zoo in San Diego where the weather's perfect and there's nothing but tourists, you ought to be able to get a crowd. So, you know, we're fortunate. We're a Cincinnati style zoo. We sort of do it Pete Rose head first slide style. Like, come on, if, if it's worth doing, we overdo it here. Yeah. Well, up next, a big vision, the $150 million fundraising campaign leading to the largest construction project in the zoo's history. An inside look when Let's Talk Sensi continues. Well, the Cincinnati Zoo has embarked on a journey like none other in its history. The project is called More Home to Roam. It is a $150 million capital campaign that was launched back in 2018 to create what the zoo calls a pachyderm paradise, the biggest construction project in the zoo's history. Thane Maynard said big donations have made the crown jewel of the project, Elephant Trek, all possible with the groundbreaking this year. Business and community leaders Harry and Linda Fath kicked off this campaign in 2018 with a major donation in the amount of $50 million. You were talking about how people support the zoo, uh, the philanthropy here. Uh, and let's talk about the capital campaign. Sure. This was a $150 million a dream uh, three years ago. Talk a little bit about that and the amazing support that you've received already. Well, Cincinnati is a generous town, that's the truth. And that's not just the zoo, but other cultural groups. I mean, just remarkable, really. I think uh, we hit way above our weight when, you know, you have guests from out of town come and you show them, you know, the art museum, music hall, and all the different things going on in the zoo. I think they're really impressed that our town has all that. And it is thanks to private support. You know, a lot of towns fund a lot of those things. Towns our size, like St. Louis, they fund it through taxes. But here, all those things I mentioned are funded through uh, private support, so that's pretty neat. Our campaign has gone well. We launched it in the summer of 2018 with the incredible leadership gift from Harry and Linda Fath, and that got us a third of the way there. And that was, of course, unprecedented, uh, frankly, in our region, and certainly unprecedented in the history of the zoo. And we have a long history of support. Since that time, we've been going gangbusters, and we're 80% of the way there. So we have 30 million more to raise. And that's a lot, but we're gonna get there. I uh, compare it to running the Flying Pig Marathon, which I've done many years, and we're at about mile 20. There's no time to stop. <laughs> Just gotta keep going. So it's been great, it really has. We've had uh, certainly more support than ever and a lot of enthusiasm for where we're headed because yes, that money's for capital, but that capital is for really the future of the zoo and what we do. So it's called More Home to Rome. Whether it's our elephants are gonna go from less than one acre to five acres but our other animals as well. We're gonna double this amount of space for black rhinos. We've already made a terrific exhibit for kangaroos and little penguins from Australia. And that affords us an opportunity to do a great job with our general visitors and members, but also to be participating in global conservation programs uh, with everything from all those species I mentioned, from uh, penguins in the wild to uh, Asian elephants in India. It's good to hear that it is going so well. Yeah. I, I can only imagine uh, 
if we rewind a year ago, you were probably wondering how are we going to make this happen in the midst of this uh, pandemic. But again, support kept coming despite the, the pandemic. Yeah, I'm sure anybody that runs any business anywhere took a great pause in March of 2020 because businesses, whether it was, you know, restaurant closing down or in the case of the zoo, really anywhere that's an attraction, uh, you wonder what the future was going to look like. Uh, I think it had been a hundred years since our zoo had ever been closed and that was for the 1918 flu. So we knew it was serious, um, but it turned around faster than we thought and, and people did stick with us. A funny thing is just as we came into this summer, we had meetings and said, gosh, I don't know if people are going to want to get in big crowds again. Oh. As soon as the mask mandate went down, we're, we're slammed. So we're an outdoor park and people want to be here and, and they want to get out. And uh, so that's been very heartening. We're very fortunate. You know, zoos by their nature are popular. Families love animals uh, by our very human nature. We're sort of uh, interested in animals and interested in nature. And that certainly reflects the support we have for our zoo. Um, and, and the crowd we have, like today, it's a nice day in the summer and, and we're slammed with probably about 10,000 people here today. Up next, how two animals put the zoo in the international spotlight in a way no one could ever imagine. A hippo named Fiona, a gorilla named Harambe. Two defining moments in the zoo's history when Let's Talk Sensei continues. Welcome back everyone, I'm Lacey Roberts. Just say the name Fiona and you immediately think of the popular and lovable hippo at the Cincinnati Zoo. In January 2017, the first Nile hippo was born at the zoo in 75 years. Fiona was premature, weighed less than 30 pounds. Her survival depended on special care 24 hours, seven days a week. Her story went viral and as they say, the rest is history. But as you will see, the zoo may have needed Fiona as much as she needed the zoo because of the death of a silverback gorilla named Harambe. Curtis continues his conversation with Cincinnati Zoo director Thane Maynard. The, the high point probably in your career, you would never imagine Fiona. <laughs> you know, this, this gift that basically was given to you. Just talk about um, Fiona, how <laughs> this animal has become really known around the world. Uh, you know, it is impossible to exaggerate the impact she's had and the popularity she's had. And think of that, because of course she's a Nile hippopotamus, and that's not prior to her usually on anybody's top 10 list. You know, people come to the zoo and they want to see giraffes and, and tigers and elephants and, and gorillas. And even when you go to Africa and you see um, hippos, you know, they're big and they're there, they're laying in the water. But boy, you save one baby premature hippo and she's, she changed the world. When she was born, I'd never seen anything like it because typically hippos as hoofed animals are very precocious. They're large when they're born, they weigh about 100 pounds, about this big born underwater, climb on their mom's back the day they're born, nurse underwater. Well, she was only 29 pounds. She looked like a little deflated rugby ball and was born just on that straw. Bibi was a new mom and confused by it. And she wasn't capable of taking care of her. And it worked out. And I mean it, it took hands on deck. We had a, a group that came to be known as Team Fiona, which were the, the animal keepers and caregivers, but also the vet team, the nutrition team, and people from all over the zoo who weighed in and would spend the night with her and take care of her. Two specialized nurses from Children's Hospital came when she got dehydrated, as preemies can, you know, get diarrhea and then they need fluids. We couldn't hit a vein and they came over and they're like, yeah, there's never been a vein we haven't hit. And so they put an IV in her and step by step, the next thing you know, when she was a couple of months old, we started to realize, hey, she's growing, she's gonna make it. But there were a lot of nervous times there in the middle. But yeah, it's funny, um, when she was a few months old, one of our former board chairs called me and said, Thane, you ought to breed Bibi again so you can have another Fiona. And I said, there's never gonna be another Fiona. She, the way it hit really was like lightning in a bottle. The, the saved from the brink premature story was part of it. The phenomenon of uh, Facebook and, and other social media sites so people followed her on, uh, on the web. I mean, that year of 2017, I traveled a lot. I went to the country of Benin, which is in the official middle of nowhere in Africa. 
uh, next to Togo, and I'm sitting at a, at a, a table and there's some people eating, and someone sees my hat, says Sensei Zhu, and says to me, isn't that where Fiona's from? And I'm like, I couldn't get farther away from here. Earlier that year, I was down in Belize in Central America bird watching. I get to this very remote site where only bird watchers go to this one place to be able to watch these very rare birds. So all these people are there. They're not interested in anything birds. And I hear these two ladies on, were on this, you know, little bird blind. And one says to the other, man, I'm glad they've got Wi-Fi because I got to follow baby Fiona. And I went over and introduced myself and she's like, I can't even believe it, you know, because, uh, yeah, she took over the world, no doubt about it. The numbers of people reached through all of that uh, are so vast that it almost sounds like you're making it up. I mean, in the billions of people saw that, you know, on her phone and on their computer. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's something. And it's, it's almost hard to say that this hippo has personality. Oh, yeah. You know, you know and I say that as this layman. but. She has a lot of personality. Well, she was, which would never happen with an animal like Hippo, hand raised. So she was so small. For many weeks, keepers not only stayed with her to observe her, they laid there and held her and kept her warm. And they'd feel, you know, she'd feel their heartbeat. And then as she got a little older and started to swim, before she swam with her mom, she swam with people. And she'd come over and rest on their shoulder. And so, yeah, she very much is human focused. Normally hoofed animals like a hippo or a zebra or a giraffe couldn't care less about people. Unless you have food, they wouldn't even be interested. In her case, you go over there with your camera or your phone, she'll swim right up like, you must be here to see me. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's something. Yeah, she's the real thing. And, and the, the paraphernalia, I mean, I mean, all the stuff, oh, yeah. the marketing is, she's, she's, she's the new Mickey Mouse, huh? <laughs> well, it, it's been neat. I mean, a ton of companies have supported the zoo and, and give a share of that. And that's terrific. It helps, obviously, in her care and care of other animals, helps in our conservation program. So it's, it's been neat all along. There have been a few where it's a tribute to how people love her. That first year, we had the uh, Fiona 1K, and it was, a, it was a walk more than a run. And it was when she turned um, 1,000 pounds. So I, I forget what her age was. Honest to goodness, it was driving rain. I mean, driving rain. Oh, thousands of people here with a t-shirt on. They're like, I'm coming for the Fiona thing. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. Terrifying moments at the zoo and only WLWT has the video of it. She came at a time that might've been the zoo's lowest point. Yeah. Talk a little bit about getting through that. And uh, I, I, I think that whole journey from Harambe to Fiona is, is, speaks volumes about the zoo's success. Yeah, it does. That was certainly a learning curve for all of us because the zoo was packed the day that unfortunately that little boy got in with Harambe and, and we had to shoot him. And that was a difficult call, but it was a call we would make again because, you know, we've got to make sure that everybody stays safe. But it was still a terrible loss and a terrible tragedy. So, you know, sometimes terrible things happen. That's just the truth. I think we got through it by being straight with people from the first day and saying this is what happened and nobody's pointing fingers and nobody's second guessing. We did our job. Up next as the zoo nears its 150th anniversary, the future looks bright when Let's Talk Cincy continues. Consider this. Prior to the pandemic, the Cincinnati Business Courier reported only Kings Island and the Museum Center had a higher attendance. More than 1.7 million people made the zoo their destination of choice in 2019, and the zoo is positioned to soar in the future. Yeah. In three, two, one. You broke ground in June. Talk a little bit about that. and and. The second part of that is just give me your, your vision of, of the zoo going forward. Well, yeah, this summer in June, we broke ground on our biggest exhibit ever, Elephant Trek, which would be a five acre facility, big yard for elephants. It'll allow us to double the size of our herd just getting started. We'll take the four we have and four new ones that are flying here on an airplane nonstop on DHL from the Dublin Zoo in Ireland. We hope that the barn, which is gonna be very, very big, 
uh, and the yard will be ready in 2023 and we'll be able to have that. It won't open to the public until 2024 because there's a number of other components. There'll be an area for gibbons, which are lesser apes from Sumatra and Borneo. There'll be Asian otters and a lot of other great amenities down there. But uh, it's an exciting time and it's a reflection of, as I mentioned, that campaign, more home to roam, giving animals more space. But more importantly, it's a reflection of the zoo's commitment to conservation. Many of the species that we have here at our zoo are the same species we had when I showed up, but there are many more endangered species than there were then. So in the case of Asian elephants, they are under pressure, but we're partnering with really good partners in Northeast India on elephant conservation programs. And we help tell that story. We help support their good work. Uh, and there's still hope for elephants, much as in our country, there've been a lot of comebacks, you know, bald eagles, American alligators, peregrine falcons, gray wolves, gray whales, all their numbers are back up to where they were 100 years ago. And so you can make conservation work if you really get after it. So uh, all these areas where the zoo's enlarging, we're also involved hands on the ground with conservation, uh, whether that's in Africa with gorillas and cheetahs or it's in India with elephants. Uh, so the brick and mortar is part of it to celebrate where the zoo is and how we're growing but really it helps our whole program thrive. I think the great thing about this zoo is that it, and we were talking about this earlier, it just feels open. You feel uh, like you are just walking through their space here, and that's intentional, right? Yeah, yeah, well, at our zoo, we're fortunate we have a great team of the animal experts and the curators working with our architect and planners to say, all right, how can we take what was, say, where Rue Valley is. That was a very threadbare part of the zoo called Wildlife Canyon. Its heyday was back in the 90s when we had Sumatran rhinos there. We're the only zoo that ever figured out how to feed them and breed them. But once they left, it was kind of threadbare. So we scraped it, put in a terrific exhibit with Rue Valley. And it's one of those going from good to great because many parts of this zoo were built in the 30s and they were revolutionary then. You know, our Monkey Island or our Velt area, the Bear Line. But 90 years later, they're worn out. So a lot of our new exhibits are doing just that, saying let's reinvent this and figure out how to have something that's really great for these animals. Well, that does it for the program today. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week for another edition of Let's Talk Sensing.